Well, good morning. Good to, good to be here. Uh, Terry was telling me that it's uh, 12 years since I was here. I knew it had been a few years, and uh, truth be told, I don't recognize a lot of you. And uh, many of you were not here, I'm sure, 12 years ago. So some of you, most of you probably, don't know who I am and don't recognize me. But in any case, it's nice to be here with you this morning and to be able to open the scriptures with you. I want to read from the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to read the first 12 verses. Matthew chapter 5 and uh, verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. And then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets." who were before you. Uh, I, want to, I want to say a few things about verses uh, 7 through 12. But before we do that, uh, I want to make a comment about uh, this whole passage. This is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, this great sermon which was delivered by the Lord Jesus. It's a sermon which has been very much misunderstood Liberal theology would tell us that this sermon contains the essence of the Christian message. It contains the golden rule, doesn't it? In chapter 7 of this, uh, of this gospel, we are told in verse 12, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. And, uh, and so they point to that, and they point to the numerous other instructions that the Lord Jesus gives, and they would tell us that what the Lord expects of us is that we seek to live a life according to the guidelines and precepts that are there in the Sermon on the Mount, and that is, uh, that is what God expects and looks for, and that is what God will be pleased with. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. That is not the essential message of Christianity. They would tell us that, some of them, that the Sermon on the Mount is the only Bible we need. But that is not so. The essence of Christianity necessarily involves not only what the Lord Jesus Christ taught, but who the Lord Jesus was. The very essence of the Christian faith is the identity of Jesus Christ, the Son of God who was manifest in flesh. It has to do with his work, the fact that he came, that he died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again, and that he's gone into heaven. That is the essence of the Christian message. You don't become a Christian by trying to live your life according to the instructions in the Sermon on the Mount. On the contrary, you become a Christian when you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You acknowledge your sin you acknowledge your unworthiness, you recognize what he has done on your behalf, and you trust in him, and on the basis of that, you are born into the family of God, and uh, you, belong, you belong to him. Martin Luther, he said about this sermon, he says, Christ is saying nothing in this sermon about how we become Christians, but only about the works and fruit that no one can do unless he already is. A Christian. What we have in this sermon, then, is a description of the characteristics of those who belong to the kingdom of heaven. Now, that has given rise to another misunderstanding with respect to this sermon. There are many, there are some, should I say, who look at this sermon and, uh, and they tell us that it has to do with the kingdom of heaven or with the kingdom of God. 
And they think in terms of the kingdom of God as something that is yet future when the Lord Jesus will return and will establish his kingdom here on this earth. And they say it doesn't have to do with us at all. This sermon has to do with what is yet in the future. Well, I I beg to disagree with that. The kingdom of God was inaugurated when the Lord Jesus Christ came. The king arrived, and with the arrival of the king, the kingdom of God was established, and everyone, everyone who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ belongs to the kingdom. We will participate. We will participate in that coming kingdom in its uh, earthly manifestation when the Lord Jesus reigns in righteousness and peace for a thousand years. We will participate in that, but already... On the basis of our faith in the Lord Jesus, we belong to the kingdom of God. And this sermon very much has to do with us. It describes the characteristics of those who belong to the kingdom of God. And that's what we have in these opening verses. They're referred to as the Beatitudes, and there are eight of them. And uh, they describe what a Christian is. It's, It's not so much a description of what a Christian should do, It is more a description of what a Christian is. You see, being is more important than doing. God is concerned in the first place, not with what we do, that's important, but in the first place, he is concerned not with what we do, but with who we are. And so we have a description here of those people who belong to the kingdom of God. Well, I, I mentioned I want to begin really at verse 7 and look at the last four, but let me just briefly mention the first four. In verse 3, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit. The poor in spirit are those who recognize that they are spiritually bankrupt. They have absolutely nothing to bring to God. There is nothing I can offer to God. There is no way that I can merit any kind of favor in the eyes of God. I am spiritually bankrupt, and I am cast entirely on the mercy of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, who mourn, people who are realistic, in looking at our world, and they, they are distressed as they look at our world, and, uh, and understandably so, as we see the, the evil and the injustice and the suffering and all that is going on in our world. Good reason to mourn. Moreover, we mourn not only because of what's going on in the world, but even as we look at ourselves and we are appalled, are we not, or we ought to be, at the things that we do. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, the meek, not not aggressive, self-assertive, looking out for his own rights, but somebody who is gentle and kind and generous in his dealing with others. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, This is their passion. This ought to be our passion uh, if we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. First and foremost, more than anything else, our desire should be righteousness. Not only righteousness in in the sense of what is sometimes referred to as imputed righteousness, or righteousness that is reckoned to me. When I trust in the Lord Jesus, Paul says it in Romans chapter 3 particularly, I was justified. I was declared righteous. I was reckoned righteous before a righteous God. But, but hungering and thirst for righteousness is more than that. Hungering and thirst for righteousness is a real desire to be righteous in my daily life and everything that I do. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Well, that brings us to verse 7. And the first of these Beatitudes that I want to make some comments on this morning, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Merciful, mercy. Uh, I I don't know about you, but I find it difficult to distinguish between grace and mercy. These two words, they're very similar, aren't they? And someone has suggested that uh, we might distinguish between them this way, that grace gives 
what we don't deserve and mercy withholds what we do deserve. Well, certainly, when we think about grace, it gives us what we don't deserve. By grace, we have been saved through faith. Uh, Our sins are many. many. We were just singing that wonderful hymn. Uh, Our sins, they are many. His mercy, his mercy is more. And uh, his grace, his mercy means that uh, I'm no longer condemned, no longer exposed to the wrath of God. But his grace goes beyond that. I'm saved. It means that I'm, I'm born into the family of God. It means that I'm a child of God. It means that I'm a son of the king. It means that I am indwelt by the Holy Spirit who is doing a work in me to make me more like the Lord Jesus Christ. It means that I'm destined for glory, destined to be like the Lord Jesus. I I don't deserve any of it, but grace gives me what I don't deserve. Mercy withholds what I do deserve. Well, I think that's an oversimplification. Sometimes that's the way it's put, but I think it's an oversimplification. Certainly it's true that uh, mercy does withhold what we does withhold what we do deserve. Psalm 103, verse 10 says this He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens, as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. Mercy withholds what we deserve. No longer, no longer under condemnation. No longer exposed to the wrath of God. It withholds what we do deserve. But as I say, that's an oversimplification. Now, on one occasion, the Lord Jesus, actually on two occasions, the Lord Jesus was approached by two blind men. And on each occasion, those blind men, they said essentially the same thing. They said, Son of David, have mercy. Have mercy on us. And the Lord Jesus heard, and he responded, and he restored their sight. Now, it's not that they were undeserving. It's not that they didn't deserve to to see like other people see. They were no less deserving of that than any of us are. It wasn't a case of mercy withholding something that they that they deserved. That's not the issue. It was simply a case of the Lord Jesus responding in compassion to someone who was in need. That's mercy. You remember the story the Lord told about the about the Good Samaritan. And the poor man has been traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, wasn't it? And, uh, and uh, Scripture says he fell among thieves, and uh, they beat him up, and they took everything that belonged to him. They left him there by the roadside, naked and, um, and half dead. Uh, and along came, along came a priest, and then a Levite, and they saw the poor fellow. And uh, I was going to say they were, they were sorry, they pitied him, and I hope they did. But even if they did, they didn't stop. They just kept going, right? And then along came the Samaritan. The Samaritan came where the man was. He saw him in distress. He saw him in his need, and he got down to where he was and did what he could and bathed his wounds and uh, anointed him with oil, as I recall, and put him on his, his donkey and took him to a place where he could be cared for. That, that's mercy. That's mercy. It's not that the man didn't deserve it. It's simply that that man was in need. And the Samaritan recognized it. In spite of the fact that he was a Samaritan and this poor fellow was a Jew and the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritan, nevertheless, here was a man who was in need. And mercy was such that he responded to that and he reached out to him. Blessed are the merciful because, the Lord says, they shall obtain mercy. Now, I don't know how that strikes you, but at first reading, it seems to me, that's a bit strange. That's a bit strange. Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. Is he saying that we only receive God's mercy if we show mercy? I mean, that's, that's one way of looking at these words, isn't it? Actually, we have something very similar later in the Gospel of Matthew where the Lord tells a story about a, a man who was uh, in debt. 
Uh, he owed uh, he owed a hundred denarii, hardly anything. But uh, sorry, he, he he owed a huge amount. He owed six million denarii, and, uh, and his master forgave him, and he wiped out the debt. And what does this fellow do? Well, he goes out and he finds somebody who owes him uh, a pittance, a hundred denarii, compared with six million. He finds this man who owes him a hundred denarii, and he insists on payment. And because the fellow doesn't respond and is able to respond, he has him put into prison, and uh, and he's to be there until he pays the debt. And uh, in Matthew, Matthew chapter 18, the Lord Jesus uh, talks about this, and this is what he says uh, that the master, when he hears about what has taken place, this is what he says or does. His master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that he was due. Because, actually I should have read earlier, then the master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt that because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So, the Lord Jesus says, my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. How are we to understand that? Is he saying in Matthew chapter 5 that we receive God's mercy only if we show mercy? And is he saying there in Matthew chapter 18 that we only experience God's forgiveness if we show forgiveness? How do we understand that? Because it's clear, isn't it, that uh, I said it earlier, God's mercy. We, we, we have nothing to offer. We have nothing to offer. And, uh, and he reaches out to us. He forgives us. He's the one who takes the initiative. He's the one who does it all. It's got nothing to do with me. Not that I merit it. So how are we to, how are we to understand this? And I would suggest that the way to understand it is this, that what he's saying in this verse is that being merciful... He's not saying that being merciful is the basis on which we receive mercy. He's saying that being merciful is the evidence that we have received God's mercy. We know something about God's mercy in our lives. When Paul writes to Titus, he explains in these words, he says that the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. God reached out to us in in his mercy. And what has he done for us? Well, well, we were sinners and we've been forgiven. We, We were enemies and we have been reconciled. We've been brought back to God. We had no hope. We were without God and without hope in the world. And now we rejoice in anticipation in hope of the, of the glory of God. Why? Because of his mercy, according to his mercy, he saved us. One of our hymns says it this way, a debtor to mercy alone, of covenant mercy I sing, nor fear, with God's righteousness on my person and offerings to bring. The terrors of law and of God with me can have nothing to do. My Savior's obedience and blood hide all my transgressions from view. According to his mercy, he saved us. Do we understand what that means? Do we understand what what God has done for us? I think what the Lord is saying in these verses is that if we really understand this, then it's inconceivable that we wouldn't show mercy to those who are in need. If we have received such a magnificent expression of mercy and mercy from God himself, if we have received that, how can we refuse to show mercy to other people? How can we be, how can we be judgmental about others? How can we be harsh and negative in the way that we treat others? Why would we hold grudges and resentment, harbor bitterness and resentment against those who have offended us. How can we do those things if we receive God's mercy? 
if we know something about God's mercy, surely we will be merciful. If we have experienced God's forgiveness, surely we will forgive others. One of Bill Gaither's hymns uh, expresses it in this way. He says, I then shall live as one who's been forgiven. What does that mean? Well, he says, I'll walk with joy to know my debts are paid. I know my name is clear before my father. I am his child, and I am not afraid. But then he goes on and he says this. So, greatly pardoned, I'll forgive my brother. The law of love, I gladly will obey. I think what the Lord Jesus is saying in these verses is simply this, that if someone is altogether devoid of mercy and a willingness to forgive, then they don't know anything about the mercy of God and the forgiveness of God. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And then in verse 8, he says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the of the pure, the word means clean, it means that there is no, no sin, there is no hypocrisy, there is no falsehood, there's no deceit, there's no guile, clean. Who among, of, who among us would say that we have a pure heart, a clean heart? The heart is the very center of our being, isn't that? Psalm 23 verse 7 says that a man thinks in his heart, so he is. The heart really is me. That's who I am. And the heart controls uh, what I do. Uh, in uh, Proverbs chapter 4, and verse 23, we read, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. And so the, the heart is me. It's right at the center of my being. And the problem is, the problem is, that, well, actually, the root problem that I have, it nevertheless, is with my heart, isn't it? The heart is deceitful, above all things, and desperately wicked. The Lord Jesus, on one occasion, he said that out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murderers, murderers, adultery, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. That's the heart. That's the heart of man. Back in the book of Genesis, when God saw the wickedness of man in the days of uh, Noah, you remember, and uh, he determines that he's going to destroy uh, them with a flood. And it says that he saw that the intention, every intention of the thoughts of his heart uh, was only evil continually. Well, how can I possibly, how can I possibly have a pure heart? How can I possibly have a clean heart? Well, let me suggest that, that we, might, uh, we might understand it in two ways. Let me suggest, first of all, that uh, every Christian, as far as God is concerned, is pure before him. We are clean. We are clean. That last night that the Lord Jesus was with his disciples in the upper room, you remember he washed their feet. And uh, Peter, Peter was resistant, wasn't he? And Peter says, you're, you're, you're never going to wash my feet. And, uh, and the Lord says, look here, if, uh, if you don't let me wash your feet, you, you have no part with me. Well, in that case, Peter says, not just, my, not just my feet, but my hands, my head, my whole person, if you like. And the Lord says to him, no, he says, that's not, that's not necessary. He says, he who is bathed doesn't need except to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And he goes on and he says, and you are clean. Not all of you. He actually says it that way, doesn't he? He says, not all of you. Not all of you are clean. He's thinking about Judas. But as far as the other 11 is concerned, he says, you are clean. You are clean. A person who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ is someone who has been cleansed. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. One of our old hymns says, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. O oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And God looks at me, 
sinner though I am, rebel though I am, with all kinds of problems and evil thoughts still in my life having to do with this sinful nature. He looked at me and he said, you're clean. You've been washed in the blood of Christ. But there's more to it than that, isn't there? It's all very well to say that as as far as my standing before God is concerned, I'm clean. I'm clean. That event took place when I trusted in Christ and I was washed. And that need never be done again. I'm washed. It's all very well to say that. But, But what about the way I live? And what about, what about the thoughts I have? What about the things that I do? We've got a long way to go, do we not? A long way to go to be pure in heart. And yet the Bible tells us that this is something that we are to, we are to do. J- James, he says this. In James chapter 4, he says, uh, he says in James chapter 4 and verse 8, Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. It's a command. He's telling us as Christians, this is something that, uh, that you're to do. You're to cleanse, cleanse your hands. You're to purify your hearts. And so on the one hand, we have something which, uh, which I'm commanded to do, but truth be told, I can't do it. I can't do it on my own. There's no way I can do it on my own. And on the other hand, the scriptures would tell us that the Spirit of God is one who works in our lives to bring this about. Philippians chapter 2 tells us that, this, that God, he, he works in us to will and to do for his good pleasure. The Spirit of God, he takes up residence in the life of the believer, and what he is about, among other things, what he does is that he proceeds to to sanctify, that's the biblical word that is often used, proceeds to sanctify, proceeds to cleanse, proceeds to make us more holy, proceeds to more, make us more like the Lord Jesus. It's not an event. It didn't happen when I trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. We all know that. We still have to contend with this sinful nature. It's a process. It's an ongoing thing. And indeed, it will go on. Paul tells us in Philippians 1 that he will go on doing this work in us until the day of Jesus Christ. And then, well, then, then we will be, we will be pure in heart. But we're not altogether passive in this. It's not, you know, that we just sort of sit back and say, okay, the Spirit of God is in me. The Spirit of God is going to do his work in me. No, no, I'm to cleanse my hands. I'm to purify my heart. There are things that I am to do. There are things which uh, I must do and that the Spirit of God will not do. And uh, there are things, well, these things that we're talking about are things which I can't do apart from the Spirit of God. But the flip side of it is that the Spirit of God won't do these things in us apart from our cooperation. We are to take action. We can do things. You know that. I know that. There's stuff in our lives that we ought to get rid of. The things that we, the things that we look at, the stuff that we read, the garbage that comes into our lives, we can't avoid it altogether, but we can take steps to minimize it, can't we? We can take steps to minimize our exposure to what is evil and corrupt and sinful. We can do that. It's not that the Spirit of God is going to come down and grab a hold of us and make us do that. We can do that. That's action we can take. There are things that we can do. We can spend our time in things which are worthwhile. We can focus on what is good and pure and avoid and avoid as much as possible that which is evil. We can expose ourselves uh, to, to the Word of God. We can meet with the people of God. Make that a priority. And make it a priority to spend time in the Word of God because, you know, at the end of the day, that's how the Spirit of God works in us. The Spirit of God works by applying the Word of God to our hearts to effect in us the change which He desires. 
And so the psalmist in Psalm 119, he says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandment. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's something we can do. We, we cannot make ourselves clean in heart. The business is the work of the Spirit of God. But we certainly can cooperate with him. And as he prompts us through the word of God as to things that we're doing we should stop doing and things we, we aren't doing that we should do as he, as he prompts us from the word of God and motivates us, we go along with him. We cooperate with him. We keep in step with the Spirit. And the result will be that over time, won't happen, won't happen perfectly in this life, but over time, we will become cleaner. We will become purer. And that's what God desires. Ultimately, of course, when the Lord Jesus comes back, we, this will be realized, and he says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's a necessary prerequisite to seeing God, you know. Without holiness, no one shall see the Lord. It's necessary. We're going to stand in the presence of a God who is 100% holy and righteous. Then it's impossible for us to do that in a sinful condition. We have to be pure. And it will happen. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, uh, doesn't John tell us in his letter that um, when the Lord Jesus returns, then we will, we will be like him because we shall see him as he is. We're going to be changed. We're going to be like the Lord Jesus. Theologians might debate, well, what is he saying there? Is he saying that we have to be changed before we can see him because no man can see the Lord? Or, or is he saying that we will see him and as a result of seeing him, we will be transformed? I, I don't care which way you look at it. The point is this, that one day we're going to see the Lord Jesus. We are going to be changed. We are going to be pure in heart. We are going to be what God desires and that we should be. One of the old hymns in the Believer's Hymn Book, I don't know, don't know if it's in the, the black book there or not, but um, it says this, and you need to think about the words a little bit. It says, then we shall be where we would be. Then we shall be what we should be. That which is not now, nor could be, then shall be our own. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are they, the peacemaker. A peacemaker is someone who uh, binds together what has been separated. It's a peacemaker. We talk these days about peace and... Um, <laughs> I think it's important that we recognize that um, peace is not appeasement. Peace is not appeasement. Back in 1938, um, Chamberlain went to Berlin, didn't he, and met with uh, Hitler. And he came back uh, to the UK and announced that uh, peace with honor, I believe it is peace for our time. And a year later, they were at war. Peace is not appeasement. And peace is not, is not something that we arrive at by sacrificing principles. It's not that we compromise. You can't compromise in order to effect peace. Martin Luther says, peace if possible, but the truth at all costs. So we have to stand for principle. We cannot compromise. But, uh, and even if it does mean that there is, uh, there is difficulty there and there is... Uh, there is a, a challenge to bring about reconciliation. We can't, we can't compromise in order to bring about any kind of, uh, any kind of togetherness. It's not, it's not peace at the cost of principle. And it's not just a truce. Isn't it interesting that these days there's a lot of talk about peace in Gaza? And uh, there are desperate attempts being made by leaders around the world in order to try to bring about, uh, bring about some kind of peace. There will never be peace in Gaza. There may be a truce, 
There may be a truce. And so for a while, there may be an end to the hostility. But peace is not an end to the hostility. Peace is an end to the enmity. And that will never be solved. It will never be solved in Gaza and in Israel. Peace is genuine reconciliation, where those who have been at odds, they are brought together and they are made one. That's what God has done for us, you know. Like Paul says in Romans chapter 5, that uh, having been justified by faith, we have peace. We have peace with God. He's not talking, by the way, about my mental condition, my emotional state. He's not talking about how I feel. He's talking about my standing before God. He's saying, look here, previously you were enemies. Now you're reconciled. The, the conflict is over. The war is at an end. The alienation has ended. And you have been brought into a relationship with God. And you now stand before God. And uh, there's no enmity, right? There's no hostility. It's all over. You have peace with God. He goes on to say in Romans 5 that uh, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. In his letter to the Colossians, he explains it further, and he uses a couple of words to describe what we once were. And he says, we were once, we were once enemies. And then he uses a couple of words to describe what we now are, and he says, we are now reconciled. Once enemies, now reconciled. What happened? He says, Christ made peace by the blood of his cross. And, and he brought together, and he binds together, that which had been separated. That's what God has done. Well, that's what we are to do. Paul says, blessed are the, the peacemakers. The Lord Jesus says, blessed are the, the peacemakers. We are exhorted to this, you know, so often in the New Testament. Let me just give you a sample. Hebrews 12, verse 14, pursue peace with all people, holiness without which no, without which no one will see the Lord. Romans 14, 19, let us pursue the things that make for peace. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 22, pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on Lord out of a pure heart. We have to be peacemakers. It means, by the way, in the first instance, that we should make sure that we are not quarrelsome and argumentative and that we contribute to strife or division. That's where we begin, right? We are not causing the problem. But where there is a problem, it means that um, if we are affected, if we are involved, then we ought to be humble and we ought to take the initiative in order to remedy the situation and to bring together what has been separated. It means, it means that as we have opportunity, we, uh, we may be involved in situations where there are some kind of negotiations between individuals who are not getting along and uh, we need in such situations to be, to be patient and loving and respectful and, uh, and to be swift to hear and slow to speak. And that means that in all of this we should be concerned for the glory of God, that his name be magnified. He says, blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called sons of God. Well, we already are sons of God, aren't we? And we, the scripture tells us that, that we are sons of God. We're children of God, John says. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. King James in the, the uh, authorized version says sons of God, but the word there is really children. But elsewhere we're told we are the sons of God. We are the sons of God. So what does he mean? We will be called the sons of God. Well, I think what he's saying is this. Our father is a peacemaker. He's the God of peace. The Lord Jesus is described as the, as the Lord of peace. He is, he is our peace. And so if we, if we follow his example and we endeavor to be a peacemaker, then we're acting like our father. We'll be like our father. We will be seen to be sons of God. And God will own us as such. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now our time's just about gone, so let me just very briefly comment on verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they shall revile, revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. We can expect that. The Lord Jesus experienced it, didn't he? He certainly did. He says, they hated me without a cause. And he was exposed to all kinds of opposition and ridicule and ultimately to a brutal death. And he said to his disciples, they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. The servant is not greater than his master. Uh, and they persecuted me, they'll persecute me. They, you, they hated me, they will hate you. And so we can count on it. And it really is no surprise, it's really no surprise when we find ourselves in the situation that we are in today in, uh, in our own country. And we discover that there is, uh, there is increasing opposition in many quarters to Christianity and to the Christian. The Christian message is an offensive message. The Christian message is not what people want to hear. It was so with the Lord Jesus. He said, they hated me without a cause. How come? Well, he says, well, if I hadn't come, they wouldn't have known their sin. They wouldn't have, they wouldn't have heard the word. And, but I've come and I've given them the word. And now he says their, their guilt is apparent, right? The word of God is what brings into conflict. In, the, in his uh, prayer to his father in John 17, he says, to his, he says to his father concerning his disciples, I have given them your word. And then he says, and the world has hated them. They, those things go together the word and the world. It's not that we are to be obnoxious in the way we present the truth. The truth itself is something that is not acceptable. The truth of God, it uh, insists that there is such a thing as absolute truth. And that doesn't go down well in Canadian society today. It uh, insists that any kind of sexual relationship outside of a man-woman relationship sin, a married relationship of one man and one woman, any kind of sexual relationship outside of that is sin. Truth of God decries the slaughter of the unborn. Something which uh, is interesting. I find it interesting and disturbing that in the United States there is a very strong movement pro-life. Where are they in Canada? We never even talk about it in Canada. We just accept it. That's the way it is. Abortion is okay. And uh, a message to the contrary is certainly not something that's palatable. The message of Christianity leaves no room for pride. It insists that we be poor in spirit. There is no way that we can have any kind of relationship with God unless we humble ourselves and acknowledge our sin and our utter need and dependence upon him. That's not that's not what people want to hear. On the message of the cross, it insists that there is only one Savior. No, 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 we live in a pluralistic society. And uh, there are all kinds of religions and all kinds of beliefs, and each has their own version of the truth, and, uh, and uh, no one has any corner on the truth. That is, that's the philosophy of pluralism, right, which permeates our society. And Christianity says no. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And they revile, and they persecute. And it's no surprise. And that's the way, that's the way it's going to be. We live in days when Christians are ridiculed and uh, accused, uh, spoken evil of. You notice that's what he says there in verse 11. They say all kinds of evil against you falsely. Well, Christians these days... They are accused of being intolerant, ignorant, hateful, right? That's the language that is used in the world. They would tell us that, uh, and then they would tell us that to speak against sin is hate. To divine marriage, as it's defined in the in the scriptures, is to hate the LBGTQ community, and to be pro-life is to hate women. To insist that a man is a male and a woman is a female. Well, that is offensive to transgender people and to resist some of the woke nonsense that's going on in our society, why that is to be racist. The Lord Jesus says, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you. 
and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice. Be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Father, we, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus and we thank you for we thank you for him. Thank you for who he was. Thank you, Father, for the message that he declared. Thank you, certainly, for what he accomplished in his death and resurrection. And, but we thank you this morning for what we have read. These words came from his lips. And we pray that uh, you would help us to, to come to grips with what they're saying and that uh, we might think about them and that we might uh, understand that this is his description of a Christian and that we might examine our own lives and see, well, how much are these things really evident in our lives? We commit ourselves to you. Thank you for our time together. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen.